Hi, and welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And my guest today is Todd Royal. He's a co-author of the recent book, Clean Energy Exploitations. Uh, Todd, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Thanks for having me, Robert. Appreciate it. So I think you know that I have my guests introduce themselves. So okay. um, rather than belabor that point, I'm going to tell you, introduce yourself, please. Okay. I'm Todd Royal. Uh, I live uh, outside of Dallas, Texas, married, have uh, two, two children, one son who's very active now in Texas football. So I feel like I'm, I'm rapidly getting uh, close to Friday Night Lights. I've been working in energy since uh, 2012, began it in graduate school when I did my master's thesis on fracking and the economic revitalization after the 2007-2008 uh, recession. I've written three books. Uh, first one was Energy Made Easy. Second was Just Green Electricity. And then this current one, Clean Energy Exploitations. My writings, my work tend to really look at the, the collision of energy, national security, foreign policy, and then really the focus has started to shift to the energy transition and then also clean energy, hence writing this book, Clean Energy Exploitations. And we should note your co-author is Ron Stein. Yep. Um, so uh, let's jump in. Uh, so why did you write this book, uh, which uh, I have a copy of right here. You, you're kind enough to send it to me. Thank uh, you. And clean Energy Exploitations. And the subtitle is Helping Citizens Understand the Environmental and Humanity Abuses that Support Clean Energy, end quotes. Yeah. Wrote it. Ron really came to me with this. Uh, we had done two previous books. I didn't think I wanted to write a book. And he started to just show me the evidence that we would kind of dug up a little bit in the second book about how wind turbines, solar panels, uh, battery storage systems, they all need fossil fuels. Basically, every component of them comes from fossil fuels. And then he had sent me the Amnesty International report uh, about what goes on with cobalt, with children, and that's what struck a chord. I have two small children. And once I dug into it, it was children my age who are being forced to do mining. Children, children, their, children their age. Yeah, children their age, pardon me. And it just, it struck a chord. And then the more and more research I did, the more horrified I became. And I said that we, yeah, we, we have to write this book. It became very personal to me. Um, it's definitely the hardest thing that I've ever had to write because seemingly every page was bringing up more and more human rights abuses, uh, people not getting electricity, uh, human flourishing just being squashed over this um, people attempting to leave uh, fossil fuels for renewables, in particular, so you know, PV solar and wind turbines. Well, let's take those in order. So. <clears throat> What about solar? Uh, I, I have researched this a little bit myself, but what? Are, what well, I'll ask you first. First, before I get to that, so uh, you, the, this book is uh, obviously it's what it's some three hundred pages now, three three hundred fifty five. All the it's, you put a ton of work into it. I mean, what are, of, of the things that you talk about in terms of this ideas of exploitation? What what's what was the you mentioned cobalt already? Is that the element or the issue that you think is the one that that got to you the most or what what of, of all of those issues that you you've covered in this book what really stands out to you two things in particular number one i know i'm touching on some of your own work if you do not have energy and electricity you do not have life um i'm a real big not just human rights but i, I like to take it a step further human flourishing and human ingenuity you cannot have those things at this time if you are relying on solar panels and wind turbines for electricity. Then when you look at the components that make up these, what's called these rare earth minerals, exotic minerals, lithium, cobalt, even copper, niodine, you know, niodinum, these are, especially in solar panels, they're toxic. They are literally arsenic cocktails that if you start to put in landfills, this is really going to affect people's water. And and I never get upset with people and they go, oh my God, fracking is going to hurt my drinking water. That's, those are, I understand that those concerns. I empathize with those concerns. But you actually have something that if you put this in a landfill, if the solar panel breaks, then you're going to need to call in an environmental cleanup service, whether it's our own EPA or something overseas. And what I'd found more and more in doing this is that when you are using solar panels, when you are using wind turbines for just electricity, 
grids are destabilized. Grids black out. Um, I'm in Texas now. I, I just lived through a six day grid blackout and that was awfully scary. And then when you take that into global concerns, places like China, India, Africa, where people, you have 600 million people which don't even have electricity right now in Africa to say that we're gonna give you these solar panels. You can only use solar panels and wind turbines. That struck at my heart. And that, that made me say, I need to begin, I need to write about this. I need to speak out about this. These people deserve a chance at life every bit as much as I have. And then when you look at a foreign policy and national security issue, China com controls the complete supply chain at this time for things such as lithium, cobalt, and what makes solar panels, iPhones, wind turbines, you name it, work. So I, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back. I asked you one thing. You covered a whole bunch of things there. I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm just making, I'm just I'm joking with you here. But yeah, I mean, all of these things do collide together. Yeah. When, you start, when you start to look at the interconnections in the global energy network, the global energy supply chains, uh, or the supply chains globally that feed the energy and power sectors, it's remarkable how intertwined all of the countries of the world are. So talk about China, uh, because you, 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 you write about China quite a lot in the book. What, uh, what sticks out there? Is it the rare earth element supplies? I know that the IEA released a report in May, um, which I guess would be after you published your book, underscoring uh, the, the, the supply chain issue on critical minerals. Uh, so talk about China. How does China figure into this? And how do you think the Chinese government and the Chinese military are looking at these issues in terms of uh, overall st uh, strategy? Well, they, they're making very public statements on it. Um, one of my favorite resources is, is, real, is Real Clear Energy. I get uh -huh. their, their morning vault. Um, they, put out, they put out some different articles just this week alone on how the Chinese government, in particular the military coalesce with the Communist Party, is letting other nations know, in particular Australia, uh, even the EU and now the United States. We control... 70 to 90% of all the rare earth minerals in the world. So if you do not do what we say, meaning let's take an issue, recognize Taiwan is the complete sole property of China, then we're going to hold these back from you or we're going to charge you more for these. So what they really do is they're weaponizing it. You, I've, I've written about the weaponization of energy. I focused on Russia in that regard, well, China has weaponizing what I would say is the clean energy uh, transition or clean energy resources. Um, you also take in, re in regards their, their human rights issues. We know their Muslim population, they're being enslaved. Uh, I always mispronounce the Uyghurs. Um, the, the, Uyghur, the Uyghurs in, 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 always, in, in, always, in Xinjiang, in the Western, yeah, Western part of China. Always, and we now we know it's been it's been highly documented that most of the solar panels going to the EU are coming out of there. So in many ways, you could actually say, and then China also controls the overwhelming amount of mining that goes on for cobalt in Africa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. If you do not have cobalt, you do not have solar panels, wind turbines, iPhones, et cetera. And we know that some of the worst human atrocities are taking place there. Children. I mean, if you look at the cover of my book, that is a picture from the Congo. So when you look at China, this interconnection, they use it as a, as a national security and foreign policy weapon. They weaponize it. And then on the human rights side, they're using their own slave labor and other slave labor to produce these that the West says we have to have. Well, and that's one of the things I've, and, and I've only, I haven't written much about that. I've mentioned it in passing. <clears throat> issue of Uyghur labor in the production of polysilicon, which is, of course, one of the key ingredients in, in photovoltaic solar panels, something like 40, 45 percent of the world's polysilicon has been coming from Xinjiang. Now, the U.S. government, I guess it was in May, passed sanctions on that on that commodity. So where does that leave the global solar sector now? I mean, are, have you looked at that? Does that yeah. does that result of that those of that trade sanctions? How does that how is that going to affect the ability of the global solar sector to then have enough polysilicon and make sure that the polysilicon isn't blood polysilicon to mix my blood diamond blood uh, uh, polysilicon uh, uh, phrasing here. How do, what's what's what what effect will that have? Well, first off, you're you're definitely correct to say blood minerals. 
because um, that's what they are. In regards to polysilicon, what you're already going to have to see is higher subsidies. You'll have to see the investment tax credit, the production tax credit for wind and solar, let's say in the United States, you will have to extend that because solar panels, we import the vast majority of all solar panels come from China or imported from China. We're still bringing in solar panels. It's just the cost will be given on to the consumer, onto the rate payer, whether business, whether at the, uh, rate, at the individual rate payer level, because the, the utilities generally will take that, pass that cost on. The US government, which you, you create this cycle of inflation because I'm gonna to have to give a larger subsidy to make solar be somewhat affordable the utility is going to have to have to pay that, and then they have sure. to pass it on to the ratepayer. So, so what you're saying is that the, the reduction, potential reduction in the supply of polysilicon from Xinjiang, will make the solar panels more expensive, and that ultimately will be paid by paid for. That increased cost will be paid for by consumers. But I guess one of the questions I had is in thinking about the supply chain issue is, you know, it, it's similar to the diamond issue or, or yeah. copper or you know oil being smuggled out of Venezuela or Iran. How do we even know? I mean, these are very complex global supply chains. Yes. How can we be certain that the polysilicon that might end up in Korea, the solar panels on the roof of my house are from Korea? How do we know that Chinese polysilicon wouldn't somehow go around the world and then somehow end up in Korea? I mean, can we even deduce that or be sure of that? We can't be entirely sure of it, though. Some of the people that do great work on it, you mentioned the IEA does very good work on it. Uh, I find Bloomberg to be a great resource up. They do great research on this. The Financial Times also does research. The Wall Street Journal tends to do some, some pretty good work on this as well. One of the things you, you tend to find in this kind of weaponization of energy is that the U.S. government highly gets involved in this. So does the EU, and they'll, they'll track it via satellite. They'll, um, when you have global shipping firms such as, let's say, Maersk or um, DSV, you, they do, those, those shipping lanes are tracked. And right now, seeming that we're seeing that the Thai, you know, the Taiwan Strait, the South China Seas, um, we're seeing those be weaponized more than ever. The, U the British Navy said they're parking a uh, aircraft carrier, they're brand new in there for the next five years. We know the Seventh Fleet is there from Japan. We, we know the, the brand new um, nuclear submarine deal that was just announced between the United States, Australia, and also the UK. So we know we have the ability to track where this is coming from. Is it going to be 100%? Of course not. But we're able to see that overwhelmingly we can, we can find this. We can find, and this typically will even be open sourced where you're able to find where this is coming from. So let's back up a little bit because in your book, you, uh, you and, and your co-author, Ron Stein, and my guest again is Todd Royal. He's the co-author of a new book called Clean Energy Exploitations. Um, you write about the fact that in 1900 was really a key demarcation period. That that year, um, I think you said it changed changed everything for the world. How so? You really started to see petroleum take off. Um, basic facts on petroleum that a lot of people don't know. Your audience likely does, but many others don't. That over 6,000 products come from a barrel of crude oil. We finally started to see. Um, so the so shoe, shoelaces, plastics. Uh, 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 shopping bags, um, my, your, your my, eye, eyeglass. my eyeglass, my eyeglasses, uh, the, our, our iPhones, our computers, uh, more importantly, like right now, the, the, the COVID-19 vaccination. There's a great article from the Wall Street Journal from about a year ago called Big Oil Comes to the Rescue. And they basically said that if you did not have the refineries, you would not have this vaccine right now. So what you started, I read something too just yesterday that said that we only started to begin to even contemplate being able to solve viruses not until around the 1880, uh, around 1880s. So this 1900 demarcation is when we finally began as human beings to be able to figure out how to have a better life, how to have toothpaste, oils and toothpaste, how to brush our teeth, how to have soap how to have, um, you know, but, but it's also, the, but, but you're, you're almost 20 years after Edison on Pearl Street, right? So you yeah. see the first big wave of electrification globally happening in the in the US and Europe and elsewhere. But you're also seeing then the growth of, of refined oil products, the proliferation of vehicles, Henry Ford, I think the first Model T is 1908. But was yeah. there something else in 1900 then that would that specific year that comes to mind? 
Specific here is really you started to see more of the, I, I can't nail it down specifically for you, but really you started to see more consumer products. It was the beginning uh -huh. of, of real, you're starting to see more consumer products. You can really make the argument as well that it's, it's what kind of led to the roaring 20s. Because uh -huh. you, really you really look, and there's a fantastic book that talks about this. Michael Novak had a book called The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism. Mm. He speaks about how the world that we truly did live in the dark ages up until about this industrial revolution and then really until about the 1900s that we find, you know, that night, that kind of 1890, 1910, really that 1900 that we finally started to be able to have consumer products. We finally did start to figure out Edison. We finally did start to figure out the automobile, mass production, factories, urbanization, and that's when you see that that year is when things really start to begin to take off more towards the modern life that you and I are now living right now. What's well, interesting, what comes to mind when you say that is Václav Smil's book, uh, which is the, uh, what, what is it Energy called? and Civilizations. Well, no, it's the one that he wrote about uh, the, uh, the era of innovation or something. It's about the, the period between the end of the American Civil War and the First World War, right? Yeah. This, uh, that, that all of the inventions that occurred during that time, the Haber-Bosch process, uh, for synthetic ammonia, uh, you know, dynamite, uh, uh, the telephone, the electricity, just the, the range of, of inventions that occurred during that, what, 50-year uh, period or so, really mm -hmm. did, then did set the stage for the, for the yeah. decades that followed. Um, you also talk a lot about the Green New Deal in your book. And um, there's legislation, as you know, that's been pending in Congress that's un you know, underway that includes a whole lot of new climate and energy policies. A lot of talk about the Green New Deal. I've written about it. Give me the thumbnail. I and mean, I do as short as you can. What's, what, are, what are the fundamental problems with this? Fundamental problems we see is that renewables are intermittent or variable, meaning when you put them on a grid, it tends to destabilize grids, leading to blackouts and brownouts. The other big issue that we found, uh, and this is the most shocking thing I swear that I found in writing all three of these books, was that it's based on this premise that if we do not do something to lower emissions, that we're going to burn up the earth, we're going to burn up the United States. But that's actually not true, because if the United States were to cease to exist, and this is based off 2017 congressional testimony, this came from the Heritage Foundation, I called them because once I read about it and looked at the regression analysis work on it, I didn't believe them, and I actually got the writer on the phone. Um, if the United States shut down, cease to exist, global emissions are still going to rise because of China, India, and Africa. So it's not that there isn't good intentions towards the Green New Deal. It's that we're not really looking at the bigger problem, which is the growth of coal-fired power plants, no environmental controls, little pollution controls, or as Michael Schellenberger says, you better have really good landfills and trash pickup coming out of China, India, and Africa. The West only makes up in the West by I mean the post-World War II liberal-led order that the United States created. You're only talking about a billion people, likely, which is the US, Europe, some Asian allies such as Japan, South Korea, Australia, Canada. That's about a billion people who are already advanced, environmentally clean, they're extremely efficient. So if we don't begin to do something with China, India, and Africa, Global emissions are going to rise no matter what we do or even what the Europeans do. But again, the shocking part was the thumbnail part is the United States could literally shut down, cease to exist, and global emissions are going to continue to rise this century. Well, well let's follow up on that because that, it, okay. you, you make, I thought about that. Uh, I was just trying to do the math the other day, and I was just looking at China and India together. Mm. And um, India's uh, electricity use on a per capita basis, I think, is something like 800 kilowatt hours per capita per year. In the U.S., it's close to 12,000. China is rising rapidly. They're at 4,000, 5,000 kilowatt hours per capita. But together, those two countries are something like, uh, well, two and a half, 2.6 billion people, 2.8 billion people. I mean, it's just a staggering number. And then you, you make that great point. Well, then you add in another billion Africans. Well, then you're up to three and a half. 4 billion people, which by my own numbers, three, there are three, three and a half billion people in the world today who use less electricity than an average kitchen refrigerator. So your, your point, here's, I guess, I'll, to be contrarian, well, you're just saying, oh, the U.S. shouldn't do anything, right? Or you're just saying, you know, you're saying we shouldn't do, you know, do any, are, is that your argument? Because I, I know where you're going, but are you saying 
the U.S. shouldn't do anything or what or put it a different way. What should the U.S. be doing? The U.S., what's worked for the U.S., what's factually worked is our emissions have gone down because we've transitioned from coal to natural gas fired power plants. We still get roughly, if I remember my numbers correctly off the top of my head, about 20% of our electricity from carbon free nuclear. But what the U.S. has also done so effectively is our cars, our transportation is so much more efficient than it, than it ever used to be. Um, we're so much better at valves, regulators, measurements. Um, because we have such a capitalistic economy, it doesn't make sense for a fracker in the Permian Basin to flare methane gas because they're losing money doing it. So it's not that the yeah, U.S. But still, I mean, but there's still flaring going on. Yeah, I mean, I've absolutely. seen it myself and some, some very large flaring going absolutely. on. Absolutely. <laughs> very, very large. But the United States also, we're already so highly efficient. And I will credit this, this transition to gas really began under President Barack Obama. Um, he's the fracking revolution began under the former president. Because people like think, oh, it's only Republicans. No, President Obama was an incredibly effective um, and I'd tell you, innovative energy president. Um, his how, how so? I mean, we'll follow up on that because, you know, I, well, I, <laughs> I'm always criticizing politicians, right? Sure. In particular, the, the Democrats and, and, well, both parties for not doing enough to promote nuclear because, in my view, the government just has to be far more involved if we're going to advance nuclear in the U.S. to, to make it grow at scale, which is what we're, what we're going to need to see happen. But um, Obama, was it benign neglect under Obama that allowed fracking to occur? Or what, 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 you're, you're giving him some accolades here. Why? Absolutely. I'm giving, if you look at, this is from my, uh, when I did my master's thesis, in, his, in one of his State of the Unions, he actually talked about fracking. He talked about natural gas. Uh, it was under President Obama that fracking actually took off. There's a great book called The Boom by Russell Gold, yeah. which, hi which highlights this. I think, I think uh, Russell does great work for the Wall Street Journal. Loved his book. It was one of my starting points for my master's thesis. Uh, President Obama, um, he's the one that, yes, he said you cannot drill on public lands, but other, other areas, um, him and, the, him and the, the Congress worked very well together to promote natural gas usage. Yes, he did things such as the Clean Power Plan, which was deemed unconstitutional. But while he was president, you saw a high transition go from the dirtiest forms, the least efficient forms of coal-fired power plants to natural gas plants. And that, that occurred under Barack Obama. Also, too, if you look at what President Obama did, he was one of the first ones to even say that our nuclear arsenal had to be updated. And typically, while they're not the same, if you're moving on the nuclear arsenal, you're probably going to be moving on nuclear power as well. Uh, President Obama did some pretty good work. He did some good work in that area. And it's shocking for people because they think, my gosh, this is a very liberal Democrat. And, and I'm like, uh, yeah, sure, there were. But when it came to those two parts of energy, um, he, did some, he did some excellent work. Well, so then why, uh, well, you mentioned nuclear. Let me, let me follow up on that. I don't, uh, I don't recall you going um, uh, uh, deeply into the nuclear uh, in your book, but we're still seeing nuclear plants. Well, Byron and Dresden in Illinois were saved. They, were, they did not close. Uh, they got a, a, a lifeline from the, from the Illinois legislature, but we're seeing a lot of nuclear plants in the U.S. close. So mm -hmm. where do, it, if we're going to have more low carbon electricity, is there, is there an uh, or what path should we be seeing in the nuclear sector? What should, how should that be working? Whether it's the new small module reactors um, or the advanced nuclear or the one that's being built in Georgia right now, uh, Vogel, you know, the two, Vo two Vogel plants. What we're going to need to see is, is better regulatory action, meaning that's such a broad statement. The ones I would say people should really look at, and we do have to do more nuclear, and we also need to do natural gas-fired power plants as well. But what we also need to do is we need to make it much easier and a shorter process to be able to build these plants. Um, the South Koreans, what I've read, do some of the best work when it comes to this. They pick a design under current plans, let's say for advanced nuclear, there's six different ways, six different types of reactors. Let's pick one, let's do that one. The South Koreans do it so efficiently, really as the Chinese do as well, because they pick one and they go and build it. And they, they're not looking for their reactors to, to burn up and cause radioactive damage. But what they're able to do is say, here's our regulatory framework. 
Here's how we're going to construct these. Let's go do that. In the United States, one of the things we do, and they're having such a hard time in Georgia, is there was just an issue. They had laid wire, I guess, I guess next to a unit. Well, the wire had already been laid. Why wasn't that uh, inspected beforehand? So now you have to stop the plant, dig all that up, and redo it. And that, that's just an inefficient, if you've ever gone through a house renovation, that's a horribly inefficient way to do something like that. So whether it's a house renovation or a nuclear plant, there needs to be very clear pathways on how we do this. And so far, that's not, what, that's not how the United States builds it. And also, we have a fear factor to get over. And Michael Schellenberger has done fantastic work in this arena over people still equate nuclear weapons with a nuclear plant. And it all began back, you know, the post, you know, post-World War II with the fear of when we dropped right. the two nuclear weapons on Japan. Well, and Robert Hargraves, uh, who has been on the podcast, he's with Thorcon International. He did a, yeah. he a great piece in the Wall Street Journal just the other day about uh, excessive fear of radiation and how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission should have issued new guidelines on radiation. And there was a, an effort to get them to uh, uh, relook at the linear no threshold uh, and the uh, as low as reasonable, reasonably achievable thresholds. And they refused to do it, which I think, and Hargraves was right, that this is something that's driving up the cost of nuclear energy um, for no good reason, because radiation is not as dangerous as people think it is. Um, but let's talk about California, because I know you live in Texas and Ron lives in California. Is California the model the U.S. should and the rest of the world should be following? Unfortunately, no. And I think we're seeing it right now, whether it's California, whether it's Germany, whether it's all of Europe, whether it's the U.K. What we're seeing is, is just this complete heavy. You're not investing in resilient, reliable energy resources, which are typically going to be coal, natural gas for electricity or obviously petroleum and oil. Um, they're going heavy nuclear. They're going, pardon me, they're going heavy renewables. It's, it's killing their grids. Their grids are unstable. Uh, now you're seeing horrible gas shortages, coal shortages. So no, I would, expand, I would expand it, not to not answer your question, but I would expand it to not only do we not want to follow the model of California, the mo that model, unfortunately, we have seen factually has caused the highest, the highest electricity prices in the country, the highest poverty rates in the country, the highest welfare, welfare rates in the country needing at least over a trillion dollars of infrastructure improvements over anybody else in the country. And they have the greatest income inequality in the country. And most people, Joe Kotkin's done great work where he says, and a lot of this begins with energy. You, you have high gas prices, you have high electrical prices that completely reverberates out the, throughout the entire economy and creates inflationary measures. Well, then you add in just to build on that high housing prices, right? And and those those are not going to be addressed, or or that housing problem may be the one that is the most difficult to address. And it looks like the state has taken some steps toward toward dealing with that, but uh, it's not going to be any kind of an immediate change in how they are able to you know provide lower cost housing, which of course is a critical part of the cost of living there. Um, uh, you mind if I add something to that? Yeah, Robert? sure. Go ahead. Because I want your audience here. There's a gentleman out there named Edward Ring, and he does as much as I love Joe Kotkin. Edward Ring, or he goes by Ed Ring, does the absolute best work on why housing is so high. The issue with what you know, Joe Kotkin calls them the the green zealots, the green clergy. Um, Clare, the clerisy, yeah, that's yeah, the clare, the clerisy. You know, Ed takes it even further, and I mean, he's called them some pretty tough names. Um, and it's these climate zealots that, as he's called them, that keeps housing from being built because it's the worry you're producing more carbon, people want bigger houses and bigger land. And he's given just great examples to say there's plenty of land in California, there's plenty of resources in California, there's no reason that housing should not be being built right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with Ring's work. Of course, I, I am familiar with 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 Kotkin. Um, so, what about ESG? How does ESG fit into this? Um, because you you write about that in the book as well. And from my conversations with people in the investment, you know, investors and in, uh, investment bankers in Houston, they're saying this is really constraining the flow of capital into hydrocarbon production. Talk about that, if you would. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've written about it also in the past. So, just kind of full disclosure. 
Uh, the different funds, it's been, it's been led by BlackRock, the world's largest money manager. Right. And it, and it just seems to be a way to stifle their competition. Um, these funds are not making money. Renewable funds are down this year significantly. And all of them are, yes, you're constraining the flow of capital. Because what, what you're really doing, Robert, is you're doing this. And I really appreciate you've asked this question. You're trying to measure good. You're trying to say, what's good? Well, is it you believe in Jesus Christ? You're a Christian, so that's good. You believe in Muhammad, that's good. You're an atheist, you're an agnostic, you're, you're Catholic. What's your definition of good? And then how are you going to measure good in the environment? I would probably say if it was you, well, people need electricity. You and I are going to agree. That's a good. The social is going to say, well, I believe the family's good. Others are going to go, I don't believe in families and single family homes. Then it comes to governance. Are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? Are you Green Party? Are you an independent? So you're taking this amalgamation of fuzzy topics that have no definitions and no meaning, but the undergirding of it all is asking the question of what is good. It reminds me so much of, if you read Plato's The Republic, what is justice? So ask yourself, what is justice? That's a broad statement. Now I'm trying to say, what's good if I'm just talking about the United States in a $20 trillion a year economy? You can't define it. So you're, you're, what you're really doing, you're, you're trying to define something that's undefinable. So, fine. So you're saying that that idea that ESG, it's too fuzzy of a concept and it can be, it can be twisted to fit whosoever agenda is, works the best. Is that? But Absolutely. It, but, but isn't it, but as I look at what's going on in Europe now, I mean, you were seeing in, several of the countries are in crisis and it's because they don't have enough hydrocarbons. Yes. So to, has, has the ESG push been a result? Has, has that resulted in, is that partly to blame? There are a lot of things happening post COVID, yeah. et cetera. But is, can we hold ESG to account for what some of the damage we're seeing in Europe today? Absolutely you can, because it's, it's telling banks that you no longer, you are evil, the bank of Robert Bryce, if you loan to a coal-fired power I like the bank. name of that bank, by the way. You like that I, bank? Oh, yeah. It's, I love that bank. It needs okay. more money. Send it yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the bank of Robert Bryce and yeah. the bank of Todd Royal. Yeah. Yeah, we are we are evil. We're based in Manhattan. You and I are evil if we loan to a coal fired power plant in South Africa. You're saying you are damaging the environment. So now your entire definition of the environment is emissions without taking into account what Bjorn Lomberg's definition would be. Michael Schellenberger's would be Robert Bryce's would be Todd Royal. You're you're so what you all you're doing is saying we're going to restrict hydrocarbons. Coal is the biggest evil. Natural gas is number two. Gasoline is three. So get rid of gasoline. And then we go to an EV. But what the solution, all the solution is wind turbines, solar panels, and EVs all backed up by utility scale storage systems. And that's going to solve all the, wor the world's problems. Backed by, e backed by ESG. And then what I've seen now, this whole just covering under global warming climate change. So yeah, absolutely ESG. I mean, you see it coming out of the World Bank, you know, no more fossil fuels loaning coming out of the U.S. government. There's a pending bill that says if a bank has more than $50 billion of assets after 2030, if they loan to a fossil fuel company, they can be heavily penalized and even have their charter taken away from them. Now, I, I'm not familiar with that. That That is remarkable because I, what we already see now, as I said, in Europe is that I mean, they're short, they're short of carbon dioxide because their fertilizer plants are shutting down. Yeah. And the shortage of fertilizer is affecting the slaughterhouses, affecting the beer makers. Now, when you start affecting my hamburgers and my beer, now that, that starts, that sounds personal for me. But let's get back to your book here, Todd. Your second, your second chapter here, uh, your first chapter is on California. We've talked about that. The yeah. second chapter is on Germany. Um, and, and you point out the, the issue of, of uh, high electricity prices. Give us a thumbnail sketch in your view on what's happening in Germany and, and uh, how they got there. They decided to do energy transition. My German's horrible, so correct it. The Inger, you know, Inger, Wind, Inger Winden. Energy uh, Wende. yeah. Thank you. Uh, one of my best friends is Swiss, is uh, German. He would just, it kills him every time I try to speak German. Uh, they decided they were going to transition under Merkel, do away with fossil fuels, 
closed their nuclear plants after the Fukushima accident. And they've gone, they get upwards of over 50% of their electricity from wind, basically wind turbines, more than solar panels. It's caused them to now have the highest electricity prices in Europe. Now you, the UK just took them over this past, about the past month. McKinsey and company came in and called it, they did a big report on it and said it was an absolute disaster. Uh, Der Spiegel also has done big articles on it where they said, this is a disaster. Uh, I would tell you now, and these are factual things, is that you've now seen they're going to have to, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline coming from Russia, they're now going to be relying on 25% of their natural gas is coming from Russia. You're now going to be answering to Vladimir Putin for all of your energy needs. So it is a national security issue. It weakens NATO since Germany is the biggest leader within, within Europe. And then you're also just with German industry, you're completely now at the behest of what the Russians want to do with natural gas. And if the wind doesn't blow, as we've seen in the North Sea that just happened with, with the Brits, and as with, they've had low wind outputs this past summer, the Germans are now having to restart their coal-fired power plants. And it just came out this past week, um, they put out their data that their, their emissions have risen as they're restarting their dirtiest forms of coal-fired power plants again. So, I, you know, <laughs> I've watched Germany as well, and I shake my head because it, it seems, you know, it's, it's, not, it's a big country, but it's not that big. And they're sure. also having big ba a major backlash in rural parts of the country against new wind projects, against new large solar projects, against high-voltage transmission. It, it seems like uh, of all of the examples that you could provide, um, and you talk about Australia, of course, um, mm -hmm. you know, Ontario, Canada is the uh, obvious other example, California. Yep. But the, the place, the province that seems at, at, to have the longest history of, call it what it is, crash decarbonization, mm -hmm. sure seems to be the, I mean, a terrible example for where the, for how this might unfold. So, uh, what do they, how do they back out of this? Is it to restart their nuclear plants? What, what is, what's the way forward for Germany? They would need to restart their plants. And unfortunately I would tell them they need to go rebuild their, their natural gas plants. Um, they need to stop their decarbonization plans and stabilize your electrical grid because it's been on the verge of collapse. They import more energy than just about anyone in the EU. I mean, those, you know, those figures can vary day to day, but if it was not for France, you would have complete blackouts. They, they import French nuclear power. Um, you're, what you're gonna see more than anything is an absolute national security nightmare based upon relying on the Russians for your gas. The New York Times has done, a great, has done great work on this, that Gazprom uh, basically reports directly to the Kremlin. You're, whenever Vladimir Putin, whenever he gets that money, foreign, uh, foreign affairs has also detailed the the absolute corruption within the, the Kremlin. That money goes directly to the army, and they directly go and invade countries as you can, as the Ukraine continues to teeter. Um, you're just seeing you're 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 seeing what not to do, and this is where. This is where I feel like I, I feel like I'm I'm the tin for you know I'm gonna put my tin for hat on and conspiracy theory guy, but I'm not because we detail it in the book. Because the real question you should, you should say is, why are people doing this? And once you look up is that there are hundreds of billions, now we're going to reach trillions of taxpayer dollars that go to companies that do not have to compete. And when you look at who owns those companies, it feels like a bad James Bond movie. Well, so name it. Well, then don't let, let's hear it. So where, tell me what we, we see. What, what we see right now is you have people like you have billionaires, guys like Tom Steyer from California, who made his billions off coal fired power plants, has become supposedly this big renewable energy guy. You see Michael Bloomberg, you see George Soros, you see Bill Gates. Then you see these multinational corporations saying, I'm going net zero, I'm decarbonizing. But what, what you're doing, and we detail in the book, is that it's literally the transferring of taxpayer dollars into things that if they did not have subsidies, meaning solar farms for electricity, wind turbine farms for electricity, they would collapse. They, they're not economically viable. When you look at the subsidy structure that goes to these, 
the moment that they are generating, that they are delivering power to the grid, a solar farm and a wind turbine, that what is happening is essentially within America, I'll keep it now to America, but it's the Europeans can do a lot of what we do as well, is that fossil, fossil fuel companies, coal-fired, natural gas, even nuclear, they're, shut, they're not getting the subsidies. So it makes their electricity higher. Renewables, oh, your costs are dropping, your costs are dropping. No, get rid of the subsidies, the market would collapse for those because they, they, be they wouldn't be able to afford well, it. And, well, isn't that the problem? And I, I, in fact, I just uh, did a short uh, uh, power brief on the issue of the, the, the three and a half trillion dollar reconciliation bill that just oh, kind of pushed through that we could see massive new subsidies for wind and solar yes. that, would, that would further distort the marketplace in, in yes. the wholesale electricity market. So it seems like despite the warnings that we're seeing around the world that this could be just ruinous in terms of reliability and affordability for the electric grid in the U.S. Well, not just that, but you're going to look at resiliency. Um, yeah, right. Well, that's the other one. Affordable. Those are my those are my hobby horses: affordability, reliability, resilience. And I add I add with it abundance and scalability, and yeah. I also I add flexibility as well. So if you really want to meet all those standards, the only one that meets it is natural gas because it's flexible; it can go up and down. Right. Um, but you have that problem of deliverability, right? And just in time, the just in time nature of the fuel, which Meredith Angwin has talked about. And it was one of the issues that it was key here in Texas, Texas yeah. um, in February, because we had such such high power, to, uh, such high power demand, uh, uh, demand for power, uh, gas for power burn, and then also huge demand for uh, home heating. Um, but let's let's uh, we've been talking for a while about you know the kind of the broad scope about this. So what's the way forward, um, uh, Todd? What do you? I mean, what? Uh, how do you see the climate debate, or how should the U.S. be thinking about climate change issues? And what's the way forward? The way we should think about it is countries that are wealthier are environmentally cleaner, and the way the way that the energy Back, you, you talk about Vaclav Smil, you know, he's given kind of this timeline that it's usually about a 40 year timeline from somebody to go from coal to natural gas or really you kind of start like at diesel fuel petroleum, let's say like the Puerto Ricans are at the moment, then you go to, you know, then you go to coal, then you go to natural gas, then you, you should go to nuclear. The way we need to think about it is look at it and go, well, how much are we actually warming? According to Richard Lindzer, we're at about 1.8 Fahrenheit to about a degree Celsius. Then we should look at what Bjorn Lomberg says, that, and even this has been backed up by the IPCC, that in 2100, my children hopefully are, are alive, is that global wealth and GDP, you know, GDP has gone up over 300%. And that if the earth does warm four degrees, it's going to take about two to three percent off global wealth. The point is, stop talking about global warming and climate change. And let's talk about, is our grid stable? Is there energy for people? Let's get the Chinese to be wealthier. Let's have the Indians be wealthier. And getting back to Africa, so the Indians are about to take over the Chinese with being the most populous country in the world in the next five to 10 years. The African continent is supposed to reach about 1.8 to 2.2 billion by around 2050, 2060. We need to stop the climate debate. We need to stop talking about global warming and climate change because the earth has warmed and it has cooled, whether you believe in creationism or but, whether but, you but don't. Let me, but let me stop Please, because I, mean, I, can, I can already hear the, you know, the critics saying, oh, there's Royal and oh, Bryce is giving him a platform. Right. He just doesn't care, you know, he doesn't understand. He's an idiot, he's yes. He's an idiot, he's a denier. Oh, he's a denier, he's a fool, yes. Yeah, he's a fool, he's not be serious about these issues. So, but what I hear you saying is you're saying, there's just too much focus on this one issue and we, yes. need, and, and, and we need a broader focus. Is that a fair? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, the earth is warming. Well, let's make it a cleaner earth then. And the only way to make it a cleaner earth is for nations to prosper and become wealthier. Um, if the Germans cannot figure out climate change, the, the beautifully technology, you know, the technology and the advancements that come out of Europe, in particular the Germans, and they are not figuring it out. They are turning back on their coal-fired power plants. Then what we should be doing is talking about is going, okay, first we need resiliency in the winter. So let's have a coal-fired power plant. Let's have coal stored on site. 
then let's use natural gas and then let's mix in nuclear. And then all of my critics, and no, I'm not a denier, is then be doing research that's continuing to be done at the Department of Energy and other wonderful research facilities around the world to make solar panels, wind turbines, and storage systems more efficient, less costly, and not have to rely on as many rare earth minerals, which causes unbelievable amounts of environmental degradation. So I'm an all of the above approach person because in the winter, you're probably gonna need coal. In the summers, the fall, when it's not as cool, you can move to lower emitting natural gas and zero carbon. And then also while you're doing research, see if we can figure out how to bring electric vehicles lower down on the spectrum and stop making the whole thing on Todd's a denier, Robert's a denier, you will not say the earth's warming uncontrollably. When factually, that's simply not true when you look at the whole course of human history and even the history of this earth. So a couple of last questions, and, and my guest is Todd Royal. He's the co-author of a, a new book called Clean Energy Exploitations. So what are you reading now, Todd? You've mentioned, we've mentioned several, you mentioned Plato, which I don't can't read for pleasure. Um, we've talked about Václav Smil and some others. Okay. So what's on your bookshelf? What are you reading these days? Okay, my first one, because I had to ask my daughter. I've been reading a book my daughter recommended to me called Wish Tree by uh, Kate Applegate. And then this other book uh, my neighbor next door gave me, which is really fascinating, called 30 Days to Understanding the Bible by uh, Max Anders. Um, and so those are two, the, the Wish Tree book, it's, these are such deep, hard topics. And you are going to get people that are going to get mad at you, get mad at me. Right. He's a denier. But these are hard topics. So honestly, there's times I just want to go read a, a lovely book called Wish Tree about a book that gives shade and just gives your wishes and says that, you know, life is, life is a beautiful, wonderful place. And then also, I am a Christian. I'm a church going guy. I believe in the Bible. So I can bring more fodder to your, to the critics. And so I really enjoyed this understanding the Bible to see that it's actually a beautifully constructed book. And I want to understand it outside of just the faith and the spiritual part of it and the faith in Christ and God. You know, it's interesting you say that what comes to mind was um, uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big Jordan Peterson fan and his podcast, of course, yeah. has some somewhat uh, a bigger number of listeners or downloaders than mine. But I'm getting there uh, over 100,000 downloads so far for since we started. So that's a good, that's a good number. Um, but he had a, a journalist named Barry Weiss on his program a while yeah. back. And here's the I'll get to the point here. She was the Wall Street Journal. Then she moved to The New York Times and and had a very unpleasant experience in the New York Times, really around political correctness uh, at the at the Times. And she talked about her job then at now she's working, uh, she has her own Substack and is doing and publishing through Substack and apparently quite successfully and good for her. But she said something that was interesting and it, it, it comes to mind when you talk about being a Christian and a believer, that she said that the people that she had encountered when in dealing with these issues around political correctness and uh, cancel culture and so on, that the ones that she found were the most formidable and the ones that were the most resolute and brought the most to the, to the, to the fight were the people who were, had deep faith, which I thought was quite interesting in that, that they're not, they, they work in the public sphere, right? They're, 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 they're out there in the fight, they're targets, yeah. but yeah. they see the broader issue and they have a deeper purpose, I guess, would be a way to think about it. And I just thought, I'm just a, it's just a quick reaction because uh, to what you said there, because I think that that inner resilience is needed if you're going to take on some of these controversial issues. It, it is. And really my faith and my belief in God, I mean, if you're going to have the Christian faith, you're going to do, take what Jesus said, which is go forth and make disciples in all the world. And what I've seen in my work in energy is if people do not have energy and electricity, that's everything. And so one of my life goals is the measurements show whether it's a billion people or four billion people do not have either don't have electricity or don't even have resilient or reliable electricity. I hope that one of my goals in life is I can look on my head, you know, my tombstone one day and go, this guy tried to get four billion people electricity. And so <laughs> faith, faith really helps me, gives me the backbone and girds me to say, Call me a denier all you want, but there's 600 million people in Africa that deserve a life every bit as much as I have. 
Well, you may have already answered this question, but it's the question I always end with. Um, so what gives you hope, Todd? Gives me hope that we are talking about big issues these days. I know people think we're divided, but whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement or whether it's you're a climate change denier, what gives me hope is that I find people are more open than ever to hear the gospel. I hear that people are more open than ever to even read books like this, which i and I find that people are more open than ever to listen to podcasts like yours. They want authenticity. That's what I find more than anything. And what gives me hope is that people are looking around and going, be authentic. I may yell and scream and say, I hate your guts. But if you're authentic about it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you respect for doing that. And I don't think we've seen that in American life in quite a while. And so that gives me a lot of hope. Well, good. Well, we'll end there. Uh, Todd Royal, many thanks for being on the Power Hungry podcast. Again, his new book, uh, he's the co-author with Ron Stein of a new book called Clean Energy Exploitations, which you can find at all fine booksellers. So uh, that's it for this issue of the Power Hungry podcast. Thanks to all of you out there for uh, tuning in and tune in for the next episode. Until then. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Todd.